Christmas is just around the corner, so I thought the thing that my 95% male audience would like the most in their algorithmically filled YouTube stocking was a video essay about the Christmas romantic comedy classic that everyone loves to hate, or hates to love. Come on, come on, get a grip. Because whatever you think about the movie, you can't deny that Love Actually is among the most enduring and popular Christmas movies of the modern age, but we're not here to talk about the movie. We're here to talk about its deleted scenes, because if there's one thing the world needs more of right now, it's love, actually. Some of these deleted scenes are excellent, some are fine, one involves gymnastics, and one is just… farts? <laughs> Also, Rowan Atkinson was originally supposed to be a literal angel. Yeah, we'll come back to that. And if you're wondering why the image quality of the deleted scenes isn't that great, it's because they're only available on the DVD. So that was $10 well spent. Now, Love Actually was moderately successful on its release, despite not getting much critical acclaim, but it really came into its own through home video. It was the most rented DVD in the UK in 2004, and that popularity has continued. Like clockwork every year, interest spikes as the holidays approach. Now, I'm not going to pretend that Love Actually is some epic masterpiece of perfect filmmaking with some hidden depth to it. And that's fine. Not every movie can be Citizen Kane, but not every movie should be Citizen Kane. You can enjoy trashy, crowd-pleasing movies for what they are and not feel like it's some guilty pleasure. This is shit, isn't it? Yep. Solid gold shit, Maestro. I'm also not here to either defend Love Actually's more controversial elements or to highlight what those are. Others have done both of those things better than I could and I've linked to some sources in the description if you want to engage in that particular debate. I like Love Actually because it does exactly what it sets out to do, be a funny, light-hearted and entertaining feel-good holiday movie. No more no less. If you think it's funny, lighthearted, and entertaining, then good for you, the movie has done its job. But if you don't like it, that's fine, but this probably isn't the video for you. Oh Jesus, not that crap again! So with that out of the way, let's look at Love Actually's deleted scenes. Originally, the movie was three and a half hours long, and to bring this down to a manageable length, the first thing writer and director Richard Curtis did was cut a single scene from each story, and generally the ones he chose to cut made sense because while entertaining, they didn't really really add anything to the overall film. Take for example the deleted scene when Billy Mack and his manager Joe, the ugliest man in the world, are trying to convince the record label to help promote the new single, which goes about as well as could be expected. And how old are you, Gina? Twelve. Actually I'm twenty-four. How old are you? I'm ninety-four. Have you ever given a very old man a blowjob? Now, like all of Bill Nye's scenes, this is very funny, but it doesn't really add anything, so if you line it up with all of his other scenes, it makes sense for this to be the one to cut if you're looking to trim the runtime. He's a bit of editing. Now, the eagle-eyed viewers among you will notice that Gina appears in the final cut just as an unnamed character. This shows how the original version just helped knit the overall story together in a bit more detail through side characters like Gina or Sarah's sick brother, who features in another, more serious deleted scene. In the final cut, he only appears here and in this montage, but he is a constant presence in Sarah's life. Unlike the Billy Mac scene, this one doesn't really have any comedy in it, but it does show us more of the depth of their relationship and the amount she cares for him. This scene establishes that she is the only one who is there for him, and it helps us understand her behaviour later in the film, even if we may still not agree with her actions. Every, everything's great. Great. I'm in hell. I also think that line of her brother's could have been one of the most powerful moments in the movie, and it's a shame we didn't get to see this side of his character. But I think the problem with including this scene would have been one of tone. Unlike the scene with Emma Thompson's character later in the film where we stay with her grief, this one is too short to have that character moment linger. We'd have just had to cut away to another story, and I don't think that would have worked very well either for the character moment, or whichever scene came after it. For example, what if we cut to one of the deleted scenes that were intended to expand on the relationship between Mark and Mia. In the final movie, the extent of their connection is this. So, uh, how's the Christmas party going? Good. I think I found a venue. A friend of mine works there. As long as your boyfriend doesn't mind. Not my boyfriend. Well, there were three deleted scenes expanding on this friendship. The first sees Mia and Mark unwrapping the new exhibition. Now, obviously I need to censor this because... Oh, somebody please think of the children! But you know what these paintings show. Oh god, it's porn. It's just porn. The other deleted scene with these characters expands on Mia's storyline. I'm thinking of having an affair with my boss. What do you think? Is he married? Yes. 
Now I think it was the correct decision to cut these scenes because even though it gives us some more context to Mia, we don't need this backstory to understand what she is doing in the main storyline. Similarly, Mark's friendship with Mia adds nothing to his story, which is about him being in love with Kira Knightley. So again, these are funny scenes if we know these characters, but in my opinion it was justified to cut them out. But I do think the third scene with these two could have stayed in the film. It's only 60 seconds, so not too heavy on the overall runtime, but what it does is establish the Mark and Mia connection more explicitly than the final film does, while building on Harry and Karen's marriage and also planting the seed for Harry's affair with Mia. One of the reasons the affair storyline leads to what is unanimously regarded as the best but saddest scene in the movie is because Harry and Karen are established to have a happy marriage. We see this in the deleted scenes too, both the one I have just shown as well as this one. Since when did my bottom stop being my bottom? Very rude. I've invested a lot of time and emotion in that bottom. But to me, this is more like the Billy Max scene from earlier. It's entertaining because we already know and like these characters, but if you're an editor trying to trim the runtime, it doesn't really add anything to the overall film that this scene doesn't. Now which doll should we give Daisy's little friend Emily? The one that looks like a transvestite or the one that looks like a dominatrix? But the reason the two scenes I've just talked about were deleted was because they relate in part to Carrie and Harry's son, Bernard. The main one is when Karen is called into the school by the headmistress to scold Bernard for an essay he wrote about his Christmas wish. I just for one day you could see people's farts. Can you imagine anything more fun? You get to the end of a huge Christmas meal and your grandmother lets rip. Now personally I think the weird cutaways with the overly comedic animation isn't really in keeping with the tone of the rest of the movie, but the point of this scene isn't really about the jokes, rather it's about the subsequent moment when Karen herself finds it hilarious and it serves as a bonding moment between her and Bernard. This actually reminds me of the storyline of Karen's friend Daniel and his recently orphaned stepson Sam. In the final cut of the film we see Sam open up to Daniel in this moment, but the groundwork for this was originally to have been set up in this deleted scene where Daniel briefly considers perusing some uh, adult websites only to have them spam his computer with pop-ups. Now this is hardly sophisticated humour but seeing Liam a very specific set of skills, Neeson panicking about hiding his porn is funnier than you'd think it would be. Anyway, because this is a comedy his father-in-law stops by to visit. Daniel hurriedly bribes Sam into taking the heat for it. Do you want to earn 50 pounds? Yes or no? I prefer 100. Fuck. Which leads to a surprisingly funny sequence, helped by the chemistry between Thomas Brodie Sangster and Liam Neeson. I don't know what to say. I hope you're ashamed of yourself. Yes, I am. It's disgusting, isn't it? Yes, it really is. Absolutely disgusting. Now I like this scene because if it was left in the movie it would actually be the first time we would have seen Daniel and Sam interact and it lays the groundwork for the more serious scene that follows. But on the other hand the movie already has slightly too many moments of Daniel saying very inappropriate things to his nine year old stepson. Unless of course Claudia Schiffer calls, we all want to have sex in every room, including yours. Yeah, on reflection maybe it's best they left it out. But the Daniel and Sam storyline brings us to the airport, the setting of the climactic moment of the film where Sam does a big over the top run through the airport to confess his love to Joanna. Well there is an alternative version of this scene. In the original draft of the movie there were lots of mentions about the fact that Sam was a brilliant gymnast and you casually saw him doing double twists and turns and so when it came to the airport uh, he um, brought his gymnastic uh, prowess into play. Here are some moments from how that would have looked. Now this scene in the final film, the one without the flips, is sometimes criticised because it's too unrealistic, but that criticism completely overlooks the fact that that's the entire point of the scene. It's meant to be a parody of the big grand romantic gestures of other rom-coms or in some cases directly reference them. In fact there's a deleted scene that would have explicitly set up this ending by revealing that the reason Sam spent all his time in his room was because he was watching classic romantic movies. Personally I think toning down the scene by removing the gymnastics 
gymnastics lets it hit the mark of being an over the top parody without being so ridiculous that it takes you out of the movie. It's a lesson for filmmakers that sometimes restraint is a good thing and making something just a bit smaller in ambition actually results in a better end product. Which brings us to the final three deleted scenes. These relate to two additional storylines that were cut entirely from the final film. The first storyline featured briefly in two cutaway scenes that were filmed on location in Kenya. In the charity that Harry and Sarah work at, we see these posters in the background. We would have ended a scene by zooming into one and hearing one of the people in the photo telling her friend about her daughter's new boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> There's also a second scene which had a similar idea behind it. Now I'm kind of in two minds about these scenes. I like them not just because they embody the movie's theme that love actually is all around, but also because they challenge our prejudices about life in developing countries and add some much needed diversity to the film. But at the same time they're essentially one-off self-contained scenes and unlike every other character in the movie they're not connected to the other stories so they feel a bit out of place. I think if Curtis was going to include them in the final cut it would have been better to connect these characters stories to the main cast more directly rather than have them be some unrelated cutaway. So even though they expand on the movie's theme, on balance it makes sense to remove them as they were written. But the final deleted scene, and probably the most well known one, is one that I think should have been included. This deleted scene shows the headmistress of Bernard's school go home and tell her partner about Bernard's essay. His Christmas wish was to see people's farts. <laughs> Bravo! That's my Christmas wish too. This is the moment that makes the fart scene worth it because it takes something so absurd but commits to it so wholesomely that we end up laughing at it for no other reason than the characters find it hilarious. But the scene takes a turn because it's clear the headmistress's partner has a chronic illness and the concert at the end of the film would have included this brief moment. That we think it's very brave her being here today in light of her recent loss. Geraldine was a wonderful and wicked woman. Sorrow is particularly hard at Christmas. So while this scene is like the scenes filmed in Kenya in that we only see these characters once, I think this one was worth including because it achieved the same thing as those scenes but in a much more effective way. The characters are directly connected to the wider cast but because we are introduced to the headmistress almost as a stereotype in the fart scene, the decision to follow her home and show us her own life is a great way of conveying the theme that love actually is all around and reminding us that every single person we meet has a story as complex and heartbreaking as our own. But including this scene would have made it necessary to include the fart scene as well which between them would have added almost seven minutes to the runtime. So while I am inclined to take Curtis at face value that the scene was cut for pacing reasons, the cynical part of me also suspects that it was removed by an overly zealous producer, worried that somehow showing two adults in a mature and loving relationship would somehow corrupt the morals of an audience watching a movie that includes adultery, lots of nudity and a literal orgy. Oh, somebody please think of the children! Also speaking of the nudity quickly, I'm going to take a moment here to do a very unrelated rant about something I see a lot when people are talking about this movie that bugs me more than it should. These two characters are not porn stars, they are stand-ins for lighting and framing. That's why Martin Freeman's character clearly says, I was standing in for Brad Pitt once. Setting up a shot takes hours and hours and you can't expect Brad Pitt to stand in place for that whole time. So you get people who have matching skin tones and similar builds to stand there while they set up all the lights and cameras and so forth so that when the multi-million dollar talent arrives it's all ready to go. In fact there's another deleted scene with these two characters where this is again made very explicit. Okay uh, stand-ins out and um, let's get ready for the actors. So the next time someone says they're porn stars please correct them. Okay I've forgotten where I was but we've covered off all the deleted scenes now so we're pretty much coming up to the end of the video. But we do have one last thing to cover and that's not so much a deleted scene as a deleted concept. One of the most memorable moments in Love Actually is this scene with Rowan Atkinson whose character is apparently named Rufus. Besides the iconic present wrapping scene, he also reappears briefly at the airport where his fumbling for his boarding pass is what allows Sam to do his big dramatic sprint. Well in the original version of the script, Rufus was a literal angel. Yeah, no, Rome was meant to be an angel which is why at the end when he turns up uh, Thomas when you're in the airport. That's what he's trying to do, he's trying to sort out people's lives. Yeah. This idea would have been first introduced in an earlier deleted scene with Karen. wants to be a lobster, but I'm an angel. I hate angels, they're just made of rubbish. 
Oh, I don't know about that. It's just that these days they probably don't have wings. They probably just look normal like you and me, but still cunningly wander around doing good. This is why Rufus takes so long to wrap Harry's gift. He was intentionally stopping him from buying it so that he wouldn't cheat on Karen. This has been confirmed by Emma Freud, Love Actually's script editor and Richard Curtis's wife. Similarly, at the airport, it explains his wink to Daniel after distracting the flight attendant. In fact, a scene was filmed where after this moment, Rufus would have walked off and simply vanished into thin air, confirming him as an angel. This definitely adds a layer to the character that's fun to bear in mind when re-watching the film, but I think it was right to remove the supernatural element in the same way as the right decision to tone down the airport run. If Rufus had shown up in a few more storylines, nudging the characters in the right direction, then maybe it could have worked, but I think this would have then carried the implication that love actually isn't all around and it needs some Christmas Cupid to put people together. So Rufus the Angel is a fun idea, but one that it was right to leave on the cutting room floor. Right, you've made it to the end of a 15 minute video about love actually, so here's a clip of Colin Firth falling into a lake. <laughs> Hey everyone, Pentex here. So I started this channel pretty much exactly a year ago and I have been absolutely blown away by the response. So I just want to say an enormous and genuine thank you to every single one of you who has subscribed to the channel or shared a video with your friends, liked or commented, or even just watched the videos. Never think that something as small as clicking one of those buttons goes unnoticed because it really, really does. I have some really exciting things lined up for next year, yes, including more Lord of the Rings and James Bond stuff. I may not be posting videos quite as frequently as I did this year, but I will still be bringing you quality Pentex content on a regular basis, so if you want to make sure you don't miss it, click all the buttons. So until the next video, Video, wherever you are, whatever you do, and whether you celebrate it or not, have a great Christmas and a very happy new year.